and turn to page 160, and we'll stand and sing all three verses of Low in the Grave He Lay. We stand. <laughs>
horrible party. It's going to be April 21st from 4 to 7. And as you saw in that, you saw in the but you didn't see any kids in them. So that's their job. It's their job to get out in their community and put these flowers up and hand out flowers and invite children and families and adults, anyone can come to a horrible party. It's just that we want it to be a time where we reach out to the community and we show them that First Baptist Church of South City loves them. And we want them to come be a part of us. And I'm going to share a verse with you right guys before I pray. It's Acts 1 8. It says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So everyone seeing you, we're all witnesses. We're all witnesses. So I ask you guys to, you know, pray about it and sign up and help in any way you can with the walk party. And also the chicken festival is May the 7th from 10 to 6. We need volunteers to sit at the tables because we're going to be passing out water, suckers, rocks, and the rubbers for the youth we're working on tonight. So exciting things are happening in the First Baptist Church. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us and all of the blessings that you give us. We can never thank you enough. And we ask you to be with us in the remainder of the service for us. And we just ask you to help us in all the events that we have coming up at the church. Because they're going to be fun. But it's not, it's, while they are fun for us, what we want to do is reach out.
dismissed to uh, nursery and junior church if there are any kids that want to take part in that. Now, just to talk for just a second about what Michelle mentioned today. You know, the block party and um, the chicken festival coming up, you know, we're going to have a couple of booths down there and we'll do the volunteers for this stuff. I mean, guys, this, this is really going to be our first opportunity. We've done a couple of small things here since we've been here. Um, but this is going to be our first chance to do something on a fairly large scale. You know, and I hope you guys are excited about it. You know, I, I am. I'm excited about getting out in the streets and actually coming into contact with people. You know, coming into contact with people that maybe don't come to church here, maybe have never come to church here. Uh, showing them what we're all about. You know, showing them that we love the Lord and we love them. You know, and, and to me that is something that's very important for a church to do. So, you know, if you would like to do something like that, you know, you don't have to volunteer for the whole day. Uh, but we would encourage you to volunteer for at least an hour. You know, you can help come set up or come break down. Uh, or you can come during an hour, you know, during the day while you're walking around, you know, the, the, the festival. You know, you can stop by and help out for about an hour or something. You know, it's, it's, it's very simple to do, and it's very rewarding. Now, this block party, you know, it's, it's going to be, um, what was the day? 21st. I'm sorry. 21st. The 21st. Thank you. I knew it was something like that. But uh, May the 21st. Um, this is going to be something we're trying to draw families in from the community. It's not just for the church. It's for everyone. We want them to get to know us. You know, like we want them to get familiar with our facilities. And we want them to see what we're about here at First Baptist Church. And we need volunteers for that as well. Uh, it would be such a blessing to see everybody come out and be a part of that. And also, we don't have any bulls. And I don't know if you had something on the three church uh, slides or not, but about Thursday Night Live. For those of you who may not have heard about that or don't know what that is, uh, we're starting a Thursday night service, one, one Thursday a month. We're going to have the second Thursday of every month, May the 12th. It's going to be the first one. Now, that, that, again, that is a service for people that might not normally come. You know, we want you guys here. I want, I'd love it if every one of you guys came on Thursday night. But uh, bring someone with you. That, that's the goal of it. Invite someone that maybe doesn't normally go to church or maybe someone that's been out of church for a while. Invite them to that service. You know, that, that's really what that's for. Um, we're going to have a, it's a little different, a little more relaxed than what we do on Sunday morning. I uh, hope you're comfortable with that, because um, I will be. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that's something to be, be praying for and something to be looking forward to. So, all right. So, uh, now that I've spoken a few minutes, uh, that's the free part of, of what I had to say today. Uh, now we're turning to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. The title of my sermon today is, Are You a Sometime, a Part-Time, or a Full-Time Christian? You know, and this is a question, you know, it, it, for a lot of people, they hear that and they say, oh, Lord, he's going he's to give us one of those sermons today. He's going to preach on us or at us. And no, it's not that at all. But I want you to look at this and think about this. this you know, if you're in Revelation 3, you're probably looking at it, you know, kind of scan, go and see what it is. You've got an idea of what I'm going to talk about today. But I want you to think about this in your life. Not, not the church, not First Baptist Church or the Southern Baptist Convention or anything like that. I want you to look at it in your life. When you think about the church of Laodicea, you know, I want you to think about how you've been living your life and maybe how you've always lived your life. You know, and, and put that in the context of being a Christian. You know, because as, as Baptists, you know, we believe in eternal salvation. We believe you can't lose your salvation. Once you're truly saved, and I, I love throwing that word truly, because a lot of people claim salvation and don't have it. But uh, if you're truly saved, you will not go to heaven. You will go to heaven. But at the same time, if you're truly saved, your desire in life is to please God, not to please yourself. You know, and, and that's where we struggle sometimes as Christians is that line of, well, pleasing myself, but also pleasing God. We want to tell that line as much as we can. We want to be happy. We want to be comfortable. But at what expense? You know, and, and that's really where we're at today, not just as a church, but as individuals and as a nation. Where are we at today, you know, as far as wanting to please God, but yet still wanting to please ourselves? Where do we fall on this spectrum? I give us three parts to it. There's probably multiple parts to it. But if I talk about all those, you guys will be bored. Your eyes will roll back in your head and you fall asleep, I guarantee you. You may do that anyway. I don't know. But, uh, but we'll see. But uh, let's go ahead and start reading today in Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 14. The word of the Lord says, Write to the angel of the church in the land of the sea, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. 
So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am coming to I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, and I need nothing. And you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from, from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for the opportunity to be here to study your word with, with like-minded believers. Lord, I pray today that someone may be here that hears this and it wakes them up. If it's me, Lord, I pray that it's me. But Lord, I pray today that we, we open our hearts and our minds up to you and, and the reality of what you are, who you are, and what you've done for us and what you continue to do for us. Just help us with this today, dear Lord. Watch over us. Lead us and guide us and everything. Uh, open this passage up to us today, dear Lord, and help us to understand it and help us to apply it to our lives. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, when you read this passage, if you've read the book of Revelation, I, I hope most of you have, if not all of you, but when you read the book of Revelation, you know, it can strike fear in someone. If, if you read it with the right frame of mind, you know, you don't look at it as a work of fiction, which a lot of people do. When you look at its future history, which is what it is, it's scary. Now, of course, if you spend any time in Bible studies or Sunday school classes or anything like that, you're going to know that the church of Laodicea was not exactly God's favorite church, was it? You know, it, there was a lot of things going on there. And, and him saying these things, you know, it, it would probably send chills down my spine if I was reading this letter to my church. You know, and a lot of people might, might be sitting here right now saying, well, yeah, I've always heard it's bad, but why is it so bad? Why was it treated so harshly? You know, why did the Lord look down on this church so much? Because we don't have a lot of information in the Bible about the way we see it. There's a few things here and there. We, we, can, we can get the gist of it. But let's go ahead and look at it just a little closer. Now, what you need to realize is Laodicea was a very wealthy city. I mean, they, in this day and age, they're one of the wealthiest cities in, in the known world. As a matter of fact, in 60 AD, uh, which was before Revelation was written, actually. Uh, 60 AD, there was an earthquake that had destroyed the city. I mean, completely leveled the city. And they were so wealthy, they were able to build back without any help from anyone else. I mean, you know, that's how much money they had. And, and, and they built their wealth in a few different markets. They, they had textiles. They, they would, they would uh, use this black wool, which was very rare. And it was very sought after. So they made a lot of money from the, from the textiles that made with the black wool. And they were also really big in the banking industry. You know, they, they were one of the big banking centers uh, of the day. And then they also had a medical school where they produced a salve that, that would help your hands. And I think, no, it's your eyes and your ears. Not your hands and your eyes, but your eyes and your ears. So, you know, they had a lot of things going for them. They were very educated people for that time uh, uh, in the history of the world. They, they had a lot of them. They had a lot of money. They had a lot of, of uh, health care products. They had a lot of different things going on. But one thing they lacked was water. You know, they, they didn't have any water. Where that city, for some reason, when the city grew, it grew in an area where there was no water. Now, so they had, what they had to do is they had to pipe their water in from about six miles away, six miles to the north of them. There was two towns, Hierapolis and Colisei. They both had springs. Hierapolis had hot springs. Colisei had cold springs. Now, when, you know, you put these pipes together and you pipe the water in from six miles away, if you have nice piping hot water, even if it's boiling hot, by the time it flows six miles down, downhill to your city, how's that water going to be? Flow that? Yeah, it's not going to be hot anymore, is it? Now, and then you have the cool springs of Colossae. You know, they were known around the world for the refreshings. But you put that cold water in those pipes and pipe it down about six or seven miles to the, to the city of Laodicea, is that water still going to be cold? It's not, is it? It's going to be lukewarm. The hot water will be lukewarm, and the cold water will be lukewarm. And, and that's why I think that, that John or Jesus, when this was given right here, that's why this reference was used, because these people would understand it. These people would know exactly what he's talking about, because even with all their wealth, even with all the textiles and, and the banking center and, and the, the medical school, Laodicea was known just as much for having lukewarm water. They were almost mocked because they were so wealthy and yet they had to have some of the worst water. They couldn't have it hot or cold because they just didn't have it. 
that Jesus used this to deal with their everyday lives. He used this passage right here. He's talking to them about things that they can reference, things that they can understand. You know, and, and that's the problem when we look at stuff a lot in the Bible today. We, we try to put, put it in our lives. We try to put it in our time frame. We try to put it in, in a context we can understand. But what it is, it's not about us putting it in our context. It's understanding the context of the people that he's actually writing to. And not only did Jesus call them lukewarm, he calls them poor, blind, and naked. Now think about it. Knowing that background, knowing that they had the textiles, knowing that they had the salve that helped the eyes, and knowing they were a banking center, you hear these descriptions of them. Jesus says, you're lukewarm, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Yet they were wealthy, they had plenty of clothes, and they had this stuff that would help their eyes, actually improve their vision. And here Jesus is using the exact opposite description of them. And they're probably thinking, what is he talking about? Obviously it wasn't about their physical, secular lives. It was about their spiritual lives. They depended so much on the things that they had that they forgot about who they needed to depend on the most. This church had a lot of problems. And Jesus is telling them, he said, you have a lot of problems. And he focuses on that one description of them, lukewarm. Let's look at what lukewarm actually means. According to Webster's Dictionary, I don't have the entire uh, definition on there, so please don't come to me and say, I'm pretty sure you didn't get it all. I just want to get one matter. It means moderately warm. Tepid. Warmish. How would you like to be described that way? You know, or how, how would you, you know, the women, those of you that cook, how would you like to be described as, hey, your food described as moderately warm? Imagine if you heated oil up to, you know, just warm temperature and you drop your raw chicken in there to try to fry it. How's that going to taste? Not too good, is it? You know, the oil's going to soak into the chicken and it's going to be all nasty. It's not going to get crispy, you know. I'm getting hungry here, but shut up. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you get what I'm saying. Lukewarm is not something that you want to be tall. You don't want to be warm. You don't want to be tepid. And you know what? When we're not fully committed to God and live according to what He wants instead of what we want, that's exactly what we want. We need to realize today, church, the Lord wants us committed or not. He doesn't want you to be here on Sunday, maybe on Wednesday. You might help him at the block party, or you might help at the, at the fall or the fall festival, chicken festival. But you know, you're not consistent. You know, you're like, well, I have a busy life. You know, we, we travel a lot. You know, I do things with the family on Sundays, or maybe it's just Saturdays our normal day to do something else other than church stuff. So we're never going to do things on Saturday. Let's try to cram it all in on one Sunday a month. You know, we get everything we need. That's not a committed. Christian. I'm not calling you lukewarm, but you're not committed. And this is what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, I need you hot or cold. I need you hot or cold. If you're hot, then that's great. God can use you. He'll put you to work. If you're cold, he knows that he can work on you. When you're lukewarm, you think you're okay. You don't need work. So when the preacher starts preaching or the teacher starts teaching and you hear the music and you start studying your Bible and things are coming out to you and you feel like it's to you, you get offended because you feel like you don't need to be preached to because you're lukewarm. You're better than a cold Christian. You're better than a person that's not a believer at all in your mind. But what does God think about it? What does the Lord think about those lukewarm, sometime Christians? You know, these, these lukewarm Christians, they can also be called Christians of convenience. You know, that, that's a good way to put it. You know, they may go to church every Sunday. They may go once a month. They may go once every six months. I, I don't know. You know, that, that's different for each person. But they're never going to apply what they hear or learn to their lives. They can quote it. They can say, I go to church. But they refuse to read the word of God outside of the confines of these walls. They refuse to pray on a continuous basis. And they refuse to do anything that may take away from their normal schedule. That is a lukewarm Christian. They're described perfectly in Matthew chapter 23, starting at verse 2. It says, The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chairs of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders.
shoulders, but they themselves are willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets and front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called rabbi by the people. Think about that. Listen to that passage right there, guys. Too many Christians fit that passage right there. They're not just the pastors, and don't get me wrong. Plenty of pastors fit that passage as well. There are plenty of lukewarm pastors preaching right now in a church somewhere, and they're trying to spit and slobber and act like they're all fired up, but in reality, they opened the Bible about 20 minutes before church started and said, I'm going to see what the Lord gives me. You know what? The Lord don't give you anything 20 minutes before. The Lord wants you to prepare all week. And that's not just the preacher. That's the congregation as well. God wants us to prepare all week for what he's trying to do for us on Sundays. But are we willing to listen? Are we willing to listen? These lukewarm Christians, they can recite what has been preached to them, but are willing to apply it. <laughs> Think about that. They're unwilling to apply it. They can recite it. They can tell you what was said. They can name all the characters that they read about. They can even tell you a little bit of context, but they refuse to apply it to their own lives. But lukewarm Christians are certainly good at telling you how to live yours. You start talking about an issue in your life, and they say, oh, I, I, let me tell you how to fix that. Lukewarm Christians are really good at telling others how to do things, but when you turn around on them and say, well, what are you doing about it? Now, that's not for me. You know, that, you're the one with the problem. Now, you're the one with the issue. Don't be trying to put it back on me. But you're not doing anything yourself. Lukewarm Christians love to give advice. They love to, to tell you how to do things. They don't like to be told how to do things themselves because they think they're okay. They think they've got it figured out. But the Word of God does not support this mindset. In fact, the, the text right there in Revelation that we read, it gives us an understanding of just how distasteful it is to God. The people on the other scene were very lukewarm. They thought they had everything. They thought they had made it because of their work, not because of their trust in God. And that's where they failed. Because in order to elevate from that, that sometime Christian status, we have to be willing to enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, that doesn't mean we have a temple somewhere, you know, like they did in, in Jerusalem or even a tabernacle. We don't have anything like that. But I'm talking about the spiritual holy of holies. We need to spend time with the holy God. Not just say, okay, I attended church. I listened to that boring preacher. We listened to a couple of songs. Now let's live the rest of our lives the way we normally do. That's not how it works as a Christian. This should be your time of rest. This one hour, hour and a half we spend in church every Sunday. This is your time of rest, guys. The rest of the week you should be out there working. You should be out there doing something to entice people to come hear the Word of God. When are we going to do that? Hebrews chapter 10 at verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, He has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain that is through His flesh. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, when you read that, you, you kind of get an understanding. Sometimes Christians, they're not really Christians at all. Sometimes Christians are the people that want the gifts of being a Christian, but not the responsibilities. They're okay with showing up to church. They feel like coming to church is a responsibility. No, it's not. This should be an honor to be in church worshiping God today. You should feel this as an honor. You should want to be here worshiping God with like-minded believers. You should want to honor God with your praise through song and your worship through listening to the word being taught. That is how we as Christians grow closer to God. We commune together. We, we break bread together, whether it's through communion or whether it's through just a meal. You know, and then we come together and we talk about our problems to each other. We uplift one another. <laughs> We don't talk about each other and beat each other down. I'm not saying anybody ever does this, but there's too many people today in church that are worried about battling against other churches and against other people in their church. We've got to get past that, guys, and we have to be the example. 
First Baptist Church has to be the example. We cannot wait on another church to be that example. I've seen too many churches where the left side is mad at the right side. Half of them want one color of carpet, the other half want the other color color. And the church splits all of a sudden you've got two churches, one right across the road. And they say, oh, we started a church plant. No, you had a church split, is what you had. We gotta, we gotta, I don't say, I'm not saying run off some kind of Christians. We shouldn't push these people out the door. They need to hear the word of God, but they need to be encouraged to acknowledge the fact that they're sometimes Christians. They're Christians of convenience. They want the gifts of eternal life, and they want the gift of that of this brotherhood that we have, but they don't want the responsibilities of helping that brotherhood to grow. Guys, I'm not the professional Christian. Just because I'm a full-time pastor doesn't mean I'm the one that does all the work. I'm here to teach you how to do the work. And then you are to go out and do the work. <coughs> and that's what we have to realize. See, you notice it's a two-way street. I can't blame you without blaming myself. And other preachers can't blame the congregation without blaming themselves. Nothing bothers me more than when I hear preachers preaching on their congregation, telling them how bad they are and how terrible they are, when in reality they're that way because of the preacher standing in the pulpit. So trust me, guys, when I'm preaching, I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself as well. We need to realize we can fall into these different states of being a Christian. You know, we can be a sometime Christian and still be at church every Sunday, still be doing all the things we're supposed to do. We can be a part-time Christian. We can be a full-time Christian. And we're going to go through different phases throughout our lives. We're going to fall back sometimes. We're going to move forward sometimes. It's going to happen. But we need to realize when it's happening so we can strive to do better. These sometimes Christians go through life every day. They don't look for God to move because they've never witnessed Him moving before. And that's sad. If you've never witnessed God move, that is very sad. You claim to be a Christian, yet you've never seen or felt God move. I'm not, I'm not going to act like it happens every day in my life, but it's happened enough that I know it when it happens. And I'm so thankful for when I experience those moments. And it's not always a big explosion type moment. Sometimes it's when you see a child of youth group pray, give her life to the Lord. That is such a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to witness. Coming to an acceptance that Jesus is their Savior. Out here at the Chicken Festival, hopefully in a few weeks, we'll, we'll be able to just talk with someone and see the hurt be lifted. But they will come to an understanding of what it means to be saved and to be loved. And it changed their life. It can't happen right there on the street in the Chicken Festival, right here in the block party in a few weeks, maybe on Thursday night, maybe right here on a Sunday morning. It can happen if we expect it. If you're just coming in already dreading how long the preacher's going to preach or how long the going to sing, then you've already defeated yourself. You're not going to feel God move because you don't want Him to move. You just want to get out of here and well. And that's what we call should. Now these part-time Christians, you know, that's the sometime Christian. These part-time Christians, they're a little better than a sometime Christian. There's a level of prayer time. You know, they'll pray some. They'll read their Bible and some, you know, from time to time. But part-time Christians, they'll let people choose what they're willing to do and what they want to do. You know, they'll say something like, you know, I'll go to Bible study, but I'm not going to fast. You know, I just don't do that. Or I'll fast, but I'm not going to read the Bible on a daily basis. You know, I'll read the Bible every day, but I, I, I won't go to church all the time. You know, yeah, I'll go to church every Sunday, but I'm not going to accept it. The call that I think the Lord's putting on my life because that's just going to be too inconvenient for my lifestyle. Or maybe even I'll accept the call that God's putting on my life, but I'm going to do it in my time. I'm going to finish my education. I'm going to get married, have a couple of kids, you know, work out my career, and then, then I'll retire and I'll do what it is God wants me to do. Those are part time Christians. We're always wanting to do things the way we want them done. People are always looking at it and saying, well, yeah, okay, God wants an awful lot. You know, all he asked me was for me to give him my life. I gave him my life. I accepted salvation. I'm a Christian. I just can't do all the other stuff. These people are the ones that are hurting the most. 
these part-time Christians that, that do everything their way. They do it part of the way, not all. Isaiah 29, 13 says, The Lord said, These people approach me with their speeches to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me, and human rules direct their worship of me. Something a lot of churches don't. Human rules direct their worship of me. Don't get me wrong, I love having order in the service. I, I feel like the, the, the service without order is just chaos, and there's really no worship there. I love an order in service. But sometimes we can get so stuck to an order of service if we try to change it around a little bit. Uh, people go, well, why'd you do that, preacher? Why'd you move the songs all at the beginning? Or why'd you split up the songs? Or why'd you cut one out? Or why'd you add one? Why did you preach 25 minutes a day instead of 45 minutes? Why did you preach 50 minutes instead of 45 minutes? You know, it's always, we, we have this, this idea of how it should be. We have this box that we want to fit it in. And when it doesn't fit, we go crazy. Church is not meant to fit in a box. A relationship with God is not meant to fit in this little box. It's not meant to be convenient to be open when you want it, closed when you don't. You either have a relationship with the Lord or you don't. When we simply honor God with our words, He is not pleased. He is not pleased. We can quote scripture. We can tell people how to live. We can tell them to come to church. We can do all these things. We can say all these things. But if we don't have actions to back them up, we're nothing more than the lukewarm Christians that he was talking about. We're still next. Words don't really mean a lot. People say, I believe. I trust. I know God will make a way. But then look at the actions in their life. Guys, we have to start backing up our words with actions. We don't have the option of picking and choosing when we walk with God. We either do or we don't. We can't serve Him today and not serve Him tomorrow and be in God's will. And you can serve today and not serve tomorrow, but you're not going to be in His will the whole time. You're either in or you're out. You're hot or you're cold. God does not want us to move you either believe he's in control or something. No matter how you look at it, a part-time Christian is still a half-time believer. And you guys have heard me say it before. You know, I've talked to people that tell me something about, I don't know about that. I said, I said well, that's a half truth. What is a half truth? Can anybody tell me? A whole lot. A whole lot. That's right. So a half-time believer, are they a believer at all? I know they can never reap the total package of benefits that God has for us. They can never experience the true happiness that a Christian living in the will of God experiences while on this earth. Because guess what, guys? I don't care if you believe it or not. When you give your life to the Lord, you become a part of His holy kingdom. I'm, I guess I live in the United States, and you know, somebody asks me, yes, I'm a citizen of the United States, but my loyalty goes to the Lord over this country. My loyalty goes to the Lord over anything this country can offer me. My loyalty to the Lord goes before my family, goes before my friends, it goes before my church. My loyalty to the Lord means more to me than anything else. And the reason it means so much to me is because I'm already a member of His holy kingdom. I'm already walking on holy, consecrated ground because I am a child of God. And I want you to experience that as well. And come to the understanding of just how important that is. And the only way we can do that is if we are full-time Christians. Full-time Christians spend less time looking at what they can see. And more time trusting in what God said to do. Now think about that. We, stop, we, we spend less time looking at what it is. And we, keep look, we continue looking at what God said it would be. Because you know what? Right now, life may not be exactly how you expected it to be. Maybe you're thinking, well, God, you promised me this and it's not there. It doesn't mean it's not coming. It's just not here yet. We need to stop listening to these preachers that want to tickle our ears with all this health and wealth theology and tell you, if you just ask for it, it's going to be given to you. If you're not getting it, then you're just not holy enough. That's garbage. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to do that. It only comes out of their mouths as long as you're filling their pockets. And there are preachers all over the place that love to preach that stuff. 
I, I seen a sign just the other day. It broke my heart. They're having some kind of service, a uh, uh, tent revival or something. They're calling it uh, a healing and miracle meeting. And of course, they're taking up donations. And I'm thinking, if God is really working in that way, is he going to require somebody to give money before he, he heals them? No, before that preacher can go up and lay his hand on them and kill them, whatever, are they going to give a donation first? Every meeting should be a healing and miracle meeting. We should expect a miracle every Sunday morning, not just in a tent on a Tuesday night in the middle of a field somewhere. We should expect miracles on a daily basis. We should expect God to come and move in our lives on a daily basis. You know, getting up and being able to breathe the air that we breathe is a miracle in and of itself. The, the, the miracle of birth is a miraculous thing. We see these things every day, but we just kind of blow them off and think, well, what's the big deal? My bank account's not full. You know, I didn't get a raise. I don't get more vacation time. Where's the miracle? We're looking for the wrong kind of miracles, guys. We need to be looking at what God wants for us instead of what we want. And this is back up to John 14, 1. So don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. Guys, don't worry about it. Things may not be exactly the way you want them to be, but don't worry about it. God's got it. And if you trust Him, it will be handled. It may not be handled at the time that you want it, but it will be handled. God's going to take care of you. You may not eat the, the dinner you want today. You may not have a, a steak waiting on you at the, at the house, but you're going to have food to eat. You know, I like to joke. You know, you can look at me and tell I've not missed too many meals. Even when Michelle and I were young, we had been married. Oh, there, there were many weeks at the end of the week, you know, I, uh, payday, we run low on food. All we might have is some ramen noodles and maybe some pinto beans or something like that. You know, but I eat every day. I never missed a meal. It may not have been filet mignon. It may not have been, you know, whatever it is that, that's your idea, sushi or whatever. But it was something to eat. It was nourishment. And I thank God for it. At the moment, I didn't realize how important that was. But looking back, when I realized God took care of me. Even when I wasn't a believer, God was taking care of me. And that's the wonderful thing about it. God is always taking care of us. But we have to be full time. We have to be all the time. And to do that, full time Christians must present themselves as a living sacrifice. And, and the thing about that, guys, is we have to look at the Lord and say, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, I'm ready to do. Today, it might not be much. Today, it might just be read your Bible, pray, stay centered on me. That might be God talking to you, not me. Another day, maybe, go talk to your neighbor. They're in need. Another day, maybe, you know, go, go down and walk, just walk the streets of the neighborhood around the church and get to know people, witness to people, talk to them, tell them you love them, and ask them to pray for them. It's easy to do, guys. God has promised, has promised abundance to those who are faithful. Matthew 5, 12 says it this way. It says, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For what that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The reward is great in heaven. It's not about the reward you receive down here. But too many times as Christians we're focused on what we have here rather than what we have there. God promises to take care of those who don't allow the actions of others to impact their lives. We have to realize, you know, yeah, people are going to laugh at us, people are going to mock us, people are going to run from us, people are going to dislike us, but God's going to always be there. 1 Peter 3 9 says, Not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing, since you were called for this, so that you may inherit a blessing. Guys, you've got to be full time, not some time. We've got to be full time, all the time. We have to be willing to stand up for the Lord and do what needs to be done. We have to be full time Christians. We have to be trusting in God even when things seem impossible. We should be trusting in God when there seems to be no way out of the situation that we're in. We have to be trusting in God and serving God when we wish we were doing something else. 
You know, if we only done things when we wanted to, we would never do anything for God because we never want to. I'm saying we. I'm putting myself right there, guys. But you know what? Some of the most joyful experiences I have had have been when we have worked our hardest for the Lord. Some of the happiest days I can remember, like I rocked the block, Zach. You know, when we when we did rock the block, we would get up at seven o'clock in the morning. The show would start till five or six in the evening, but we would work all day getting the stage ready. And getting, uh, the kids would have would have a block party, and then uh, we had to get everything together. The block party would start about three o'clock, and we let the kids play. We give away hot dogs. You know, it was just busy, running all over town, trying to coordinate with the sponsors of it and the pe and the people that, that volunteered their time, and then the bands would come out. You know, you have to talk to them and get stage time ready for them and do all this different stuff. And it was hard. You know, I wear a Fitbit uh, on my arm. On you know, I would wear one of these. And I would take like 40,000 steps on those days. And if you don't know, that's a lot of steps, guys. If you don't wear one, you probably think you walk that much. You probably walk about 1,500 steps in a day. 40,000 steps is a lot. My feet were tired. I hurt. People would get sick when they hear me. Blake and Jensen, my, my son and his wife, they got sick and had to leave early. They missed their favorite band. And I mean, it was a big number for other people get today because, you know, it's just so hard. But those, those days, even though you wake up dreading it, by the time you get finished with it, it is the most rewarding because you touch somebody's life with the Word of God. We've got to be good to it. We've got to be full-time Christians, guys. We've got to be full-time. And the reason we need to be full-time is because he loves us full-time. He loves us full-time. He cares for us full-time. He provides for us full-time. Not just whenever we're obedient to him. Not just whenever we're in church on Sunday or on Wednesday. But he provides for us all the time. He loves us all the time. He protects us all the time. And we need to reciprocate that. We need to give back to him all the time. I don't want to be the bottom that he skews out. I don't want to be that lukewarm Christian that Jesus talked about in the same revelation. I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. And I pray you want to be a part of the solution as well. I pray that today you're thinking, you know what, yeah, I, I might have been living a part-time Christian life or even a sometime Christian life. I may not have been fully committed to the Lord, but today I'm ready to commit. Today I'm ready to show God how much I love Him because He loved me so much. What did we just celebrate last week? Can anybody tell me? Resurrection. I heard a couple of them today. You said Easter, Randy? Was it Easter we celebrated or was it the resurrection we celebrated? It was the resurrection. We've created Easter, you know, with the bunny rabbits and the eggs and all that. Don't ask me how a rabbit has an egg. But we celebrate the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus. And the only way he was resurrected was he had to die. He had to die a painful death on the cross for us. He loved us that much that he gave it all. Literally gave it all. The only time in, in Jesus' existence that he felt the absence of God was when he was hanging on that cross. Now imagine that. Having the presence of God in your life at all times, and then at the moment you need it the most, it's gone. But instead of Jesus saying, uh, calling a legion of angels down and, and saying, take me down from this cross, make me the king of Jerusalem, he hung there. He said, I am thirsty. And they gave him vinegar, a sour wine. And then he died. A beaten, bloody, naked man hanging on that cross. He loved us that much. And all he asks is to say, all he asks of us is to get full time to him. But guys, that doesn't mean. Read your Bible constantly. That doesn't mean walk around and you know stop and pray 14 times a day. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be at church every time the preacher's in church. You don't have to do everything the church people do. You know, you, you still have a life, and God understands that. But God wants you to be full time. Even when you're out there doing the things in this life, working your job, meeting with your friends, you should still be a witness to him 
in everything that you do. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be a light to this community and show them that we love them regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the language that they speak, regardless of their socioeconomic status? We love them and we want them here. But if not here, then we want them somewhere in church. If we focus on kingdom growth, guys, the church will grow. I can promise you that. Go read the book of Acts. You know, see, they're not trying to get people to come to the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. They're just preaching salvation. They're preaching Christ and being crucified. And, and the church is being, being built by, uh, you know, that thousands added to it daily. Are we ready to experience that? I hope we are. Trade is song for I want you to know this altar is always open. You know, it is. I say that every week. But I like to remind you what's up. And even, even if you don't know if you're preaching, if you want to come forward and pray, I would love it if you came forward. I'd stop preaching and pray with you. If that's what you desire. But I want you to think about the life. Now, I asked you right there at the beginning to put this in context of your life. Sometime, part time, full time. Where do you fall on that spare? And you might say, well, I'm a full time Christian. Preacher, I, I'm right there where you're talking about. I'm, I'm good to go. That's where I'm glad you are. Why don't you come and say, Lord, help me to continue. Help me to continue in this status that I'm in. Help me to continue being on fire. Help me to continue doing everything the way you want me to do it. <laughs> Joy, if you're not in that status, that's okay. I'm not here to preach on you or to you. I'm just here to tell you that God loves you. And God says, you know what, if you're a part-time Christian right now, I'm ready to make full time. If you're a sometime Christian right now, I'm ready to make you full time. The Lord accepts you just as you are. Once you come and give your life to Him, He will mold you into what He wants you to be. If anyone tells you any different than that, they're not preaching the Word. Don't be ashamed of where you're at in this life. Don't be ashamed to admit, maybe I'm not as, as, as close to God as I need to be or I want to be. We have to admit those things before we can be held with those things. And those that refuse to admit never get the help. And they grow colder and colder and colder. Did they ever have a relationship with the Lord? I don't know. I can't speak to that. It's not my job to judge people. But I know the fruit bears. When you live a life like that, no one would ever expect you to be a Christian. And the Lord tells us we know His children because of the way they love one another. And I love you guys today. That's why I'm saying this. That's why I'm saying we need to refocus. We need to renew. We need to get back to where God wants us to. Let's do that story today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. Thank you for each and every one of you come out. Lord, I thank you just for the opportunity to be here. Lord, I pray today that we look at our lives, not at everybody else's, but at our own. And we see where we're at. Are we a sometime Christian? Are we a part time Christian? Or are we right there where we need to be as a full time Christian? Lord, I pray that no matter where we're at, where we see ourselves that we don't have so much pride that we allow ourselves to stay in that state. Help us to open up and realize that we need you in everything, Lord, that we need to worship you and honor you in everything. We need to live a life pleasing to you in every way. To be a witness to this community around us. Just help us and choke us. Lead us and guide us in everything. In Jesus' name. Amen.
we're having our spring meeting, our association meeting right here at the church. I encourage all of you to come out. You don't have to be a messenger to be here. Uh, you don't have to be a messenger to vote. But uh, you can come. And it's not going to just be a business meeting. You know, I don't think it was that. We're going to try to have a worship service. I've been talking with Barry, our new uh, 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 associational missionary. And we're trying to make it more of a worship service. Uh, we're going to have a message and, and have some singing involved. It's going to be about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, the service would. I encourage you to come out for that though tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And then Tuesday night, of course, we always have choir practice in the choir room directly behind the sanctuary here. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of the choir, I'm sure Randy would love to have you. Uh, we, the more we have, the louder that choir is, the better it sounds, guys. So if you're, if you're interested, let us talk to, talk to uh, Randy and you can get some more information. And then, of course, on coming Saturday, May the 7th, we have the Chicken Festival. It's already been mentioned. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer, we'd love to have you. We have sign-up sheets. I think there's one in the foyer up here and one in the educational wing up there on the coffee pot. Uh, somewhere, I'm not really sure. You'll see it has a pen and some paper there. And then May the 12th, Thursday, May the 12th, is our first Thursday Night Live. Uh, the, uh, the music's coming together. You know, the praise band's coming together. They'll be practicing with that. Uh, so I encourage you to come out for that and invite someone to come with you. And then, of course, Saturday, May 21st, we're having our community block party. Seems like there's something else. I don't know. We've been talking about so much lately. But there's a lot going on, guys. May is going to be a busy month. It's also my birthday in May. So. <laughs> so, that, that's it. That's what we want to say. But, uh, but, no, uh, but uh, let's, let's be praying about all these things. I'm not asking you to, be, to commit to all of this. But pray about it. See what God may be leading you to do. You may, God may be leading you to help us one hour at the chicken festival. God may be leading you to help at the block party. God may be leading you to come to that Thursday night service with somebody. You know, whatever it may be, it may be one of them, it may be, maybe all of them. I don't know. But just just be be honoring God in everything that you do. And also, uh, one more thing. We are we are trying to start a bus ministry up. If you uh, know someone that would need a ride or would like a ride, uh, let us know. We'll give us a name and a number. We'll get in touch with them and see what we can do. And guys, I just want to thank you for coming out. Also, I almost forgot, uh, we do have a, a couple with us this morning. Uh, Stephen and Wendy Simmons, uh, they're here with us. They're missionaries. They're getting ready to go to Mexico. Am I correct in that? Okay. I, I, couldn't, I knew it was Central America somewhere, but I wasn't sure. Mexico. Uh, he was here at Sunday school this morning, but he has some prayer cards. If you'd like to talk with him, you know, he, he's right here. He'd love to talk with anybody that wants to talk with him about what he's about to do. So uh, let's be praying for him and his wife, and uh, let's be praying for uh, success in, in, in their missionary efforts. So, uh, guys, thank you for being here. Have a blessed day. Go out and be a light to the world. Thank you.